Hello everyone. So my talk will be about security and for Rails engineers. So this little information about me, uh, mostly to be clear, I'm a developer, I'm DevOps, but I'm not security specialist. Uh, I did some open source libraries, some open source books, uh, and leading Everpod podcast about Ruby and JavaScript. So let's go to our main topic, security. So I hope everybody understands what security is way of protection your computer system from the seeds or also way to avoid damages your hardware software stuff or data so in companies security mostly divided by several areas in this case it exists application security areas it's team which mostly working with application and thinking about security of this application incident response and monitoring mostly they work and start working if some incident happens uh, corporate and IT security, it's mostly about giving you access to accounts, to device monitoring, and also uh, GRC or government risk and compliance, which mostly work about certifications. So today we'll mostly talk, as you can see, security is a big topic. I cannot cover all of this in 30 minutes, but I will try. So about web application security basis, which I hope everybody understand. We should use HTTPS, we should encrypt our traffic, avoid injections, we should never trust user input, like never. Uh, sensitive data exposure, also the problem. Sometimes somebody start logging from the proxy more verbose information and forgot that it doesn't contain future passwords or secret tokens, and in this case you have this data exposure. Uh, broken access control, for example, you use SSH with passwords, which of course not very good, or open database to the world. Uh, security misconfiguration, like let's no patch this system, security patches is not so important, and keep secrets out of your code. Please doesn't commit your secrets in repository. So when we start thinking about security, most simple and very good approach is thinking about HTTP headers, because HTTP headers provide very useful information for browsers, how exactly should your application works, and uh, how exactly it shouldn't work in these cases. For us, one of the critical header, which I think everybody should use, it's Content Security Policy, CSP. Uh, this header, it's uh, like first line of defense against, uh, from cross-site scripting attacks, injection attacks, because by using this uh, header, you explain to browser, like, I allow to load these JavaScript files, I allow to load these CSS files, media, and everything else. In these cases, even if you be found some security flaws in your application, like somebody found how to inject JavaScript, but you still doesn't allow to do some evaluation or inlining, in these cases, browser will say, no, I will not execute this code, and you will be safe. That's why from Rails, 5.2, uh, they also have this DSL, which you can use, and describe in this case is your content security policy, uh, like what is your default policy, what is your script policy, uh, what is your report URI, report URI used to notify if uh, somebody breach or try like misuse this policy, uh, or for example, you forgot add some of your resource into this policy. Also, of course, it have helpers in controllers, for example, you have some part of application where you want to lose, use loosey policy, like no so strict, or another approach, like you have some part of application, like in our case, where we should show for user his HTML, CSS, JavaScript stuff, and of course, this uh, policy more strict. We don't want for this customer to do some uh, JavaScript execution in these cases or do something else, which bet, of course, for us. Uh, Best approach, which we found out uh, how to use, it's uh, remove unsafe in line and unsafe evil from content security policy for script tech. In these cases, like uh, even if somebody tried to do some execution of this JavaScript code, like href JavaScript alert one, or do some inlining, in these cases it will not work. Browser will just say, I refuse to execute this code. Uh, of course, uh, you should uh, check that your inline scripts and everything else also whitelisted. You can use for these uh, checksums, which you also can provide. Like in this example, you 
have some checksums or cryptographical nonce, which you uh, can also generate and say like this script X I allow to execute. So in these cases, as you can see, it's like fully good uh, secure stuff because right now it's working in all major browsers. Uh, but if you forgot something to add, like some, if you have big project and you forgot something, like some resources, it just stopped working, which of course not very good. That's why exists additional, not additional, but separate header called content security policy report only, which you can deploy with your application, like you preparing for content security and checking your report URI, like what exactly violates this content security policy. If uh, like you forgot some JavaScript or CSS stuff, you just add this, deploy again, and check in the not generated new error reports. If everything good, you just change content security policy uh, report only to content security policy. In these cases, uh, by the way, it's very good approach to collect all these reports. Uh, like this is how it looks like, partially. Uh, yes. So this is we using for collection Sentry, so our own hosted Sentry, and as you can see, I can collect some information. Uh, like, uh, for example, did we have some evaluation of this JavaScript stuff. We violate some script tag. So this is how it works. It looks like. So right now we can also analyze and check what exactly going on, what exactly customer trying to hijack our JavaScript stuff into our application, or maybe some library which we used also have these security flaws, and we need to fix or patch this library. So uh, also very good approach. Use separate project in the Sentry, not the same as you use for error reporting about your application inside Ruby and Rails, because sometimes for some applications, it's it can generate a bunch of these reports, like many of them, and you can skip very important error traces or something like this, because like for our case, for some of our application, it can generate huge amount of these reports, because some customers use plugins into the browser or something else which try to inject own JavaScript into our page and of course content security policies say nope, you will not do this. Next one header is strict transport security. Uh, why we should use it, this? Of course you can use this only with HTTPS and HTTPS as default way. Like you have, if you have even HTTP it's only for redirect to HTTPS. Uh, the main approach, imagine you go into some airport, connect to Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, and go to your banking account. By default, browser will go by HTTP protocol, and of course, bank will try to redirect you by, to HTTPS. The main problem is create opportunity to man in the middle attack, because somebody can sniff this unencrypted traffic and main own, made own redirect to another website, which phishing website. And in these cases, like, your information can be stolen. That's why this header, which of course going with your HTTPS traffic, say to browser like, forgot about HTTP. Like even if customer will enter HTTP header, you should this amount of time, this is max H in these cases, you should, it's in seconds of course, you should remember like this amount of time, you, sh you should always go by HTTPS. Of course it have additional attributes include domains, so in this case, the browser also will remember not only go by what your domain, but also all subdomains by HTTPS. And additional key which you can use is preload. Uh, it's not by specification. It's supported by Google and all these browser supports. The main idea why this also important because if you first time visiting the website, of course, browser doesn't know about uh, strict transport security. Like first visiting should uh, happen before, it, like a browser remember for me this uh, amount of time that it always should go by HTTPS. So preload is special key which you said, uh, please add us into preload list and browsers contain this special domain list which even if it was first uh, visiting of this website, it just go directly by HTTPS. Uh, if you will go to using strict transport security and in one day you will decide go to HTTP back, I don't know why, but imagine you will decide to do this, you will need like remove this header and wait at least this amount of time why every browser forgot about your strict transport security. Because if you will just stop uh, serving HTTPS, uh, just every browser will be broken. It's always try to go by HTTPS. So better to use HTTPS and not forgot to renew your certificates. 
Next one, X-Frame options. It uh, can deny or allow some domains inject you in iframe. Uh, if you, for example, have something like X-Frame option deny, this is how it looks like this page, which you try to inject into the browser, like it's not loaded. Uh, why this uh, using? Because we have such attack code clickjacking. Clickjacking attack is somebody inject your website into iframe, paint some interface on top of it, and if user try to click some buttons on this paint interface, in this case, it click buttons on your website. So it's possible to do some not very good stuff on your website. That's why uh, mostly you should also use these X-Frame options and define where exactly you're allowed to uh, add, integrate your website into our frames. For example, you have some widget stuff, or maybe you allow iframe into yourself, like same origin. In these cases, it's more secure. Of course, exist many other headers. I cannot cover all of them, like X access protection, X content type options about Mimi hijacking, uh, sniffing, Mimi sniffing. Also, referer policy about how many information go into a referer header by another website. Because sometimes it can happen, like you have some social buttons and you have forgot password page which contain your secure header about for like reset your password and if a user clicks some social button in refer header this social network will get OURU with this secret token which of course not uh, allowed that's why better to set up your refer policies feature policies and of course cache control pragma and expires uh, somebody can say like Alex three was one it's not about security it's about cache and you will be right, because exists also such problem like called cache pollution. If you're not uh, in good way set up your caching in the browser, like you have some page with billing information, with secret tokens, and you not provide like, please browser doesn't cache this page. In these cases, if user log it out from your browser and somebody else click back button, it will show this page if you don't provide these headers. In these cases, it will be cache pollution because you like provide maybe sensitive information from the browser cache. That's why better in this for this controller in these pages also provide like please private no cache no store max h zero like please never cache go directly to our server and check it again. Uh, and of course about Rails, so Rails provide all many of these headers automatically, like you no need to think. Like if you generate new Rails project, sometimes you already see all these headers. Also, you can set up, of course, your HSTS, uh, this stuff about expiration, subdomains, preload, everything else here. Uh, but of course, if you have old project and you each time try to update this project, please uh, check that maybe a Rails team added new security headers, which you also need not forget to add into your list. So please be sure, because each time when we update Rails application, sometimes happens, oh, they add new header, security header, so we should add this header into our application. So next, go to web. What about web? So of course, no inline scripts due content security policy. Please, you like use hash algorithm, use cryptographical nonce, but please don't allow to do inline or evaluation. Right now, all Mostly all JavaScript frameworks like Angular, Vue.js can work without this, and libraries like React, it's not a problem. Uh, use autocomplete off for sensitive fields, like it's also a very good approach. Use JSON escape for passing variables into JavaScript. Somebody like approach like inline some bootstrap information into script tag, and then JavaScript application start to just read this information. But happens funny story, then I go then some application use this approach, and I go into settings page, I have some my full name, and I close script tag in this full name, and application broke fully. Like it stopped working because closed script tag is exactly was interpreted in web application as closed script tag, and JSON was fully broken. So even better approach, not use this inlining. Like better do separate requests for all your data. And don't use assets from public CDN. It creates some unnecessary availability and security risk. Um, somebody can say, okay, I will use my CDN. It will be cool, it will work, it, everything will be correct. But yeah, exist also problems. Like in our case, our S3 credentials for CDN was leaked. And some hacker tried to inject additional malware in our JavaScript files. So like server was okay but CDN was compromised. 
but uh, like our application not start to serve in this malicious web code, uh, this JavaScript code, but just stop working. At least it was good sign for us, and we start digging out what's going on. How this st uh, stopping to work? We use such stuff like sub-resource integrity. It's additional stuff attribute which you can add into your. This is how it looks into link or script tag. It's checksum of your files, like CS, uh, content checksum, like from CSS or JavaScript files. And if somebody tried to inject some new code into your CSS or JavaScript files and check some browser download this file, check checksum, checksum not match which you provide in HTML, so it just not execute this JavaScript or not load this CSS files. Uh, right now in Rails you can use this exist JavaScript include text, which you write just integrity true, and it automatically add this checksum for your JavaScript or CSS files. Um, maybe not good news, the packer still doesn't support this. So if you want this feature, uh, you need to use some additional plugins or do some uh, yourself this stuff. Uh, but still, like it's very good feature if you use your CDN and also make you safe about compromising this CDN. So let me tell you about a little story. Uh, we, have our, we had our application, and this application have registration, login form, everything else. A login uh, and forgot password form was saved about brute force attack, but in one day some bots start creating many registration for our registration form. And we start thinking, okay, what's this bot try to achieve? Because for each registration, you still need to confirm account. You cannot log it in just simple in this way. And in one week, our mail system stopped working. Like, we start digging out what is going on. And this is what happens. This bot starts registering too many users for different email addresses. And imagine you, the same customer, and get email, please confirm your account. What's your first reaction? It's spam. And in one uh, week, this escalates to so big a spam score that our email provider just automatically block email addresses for us, and application just stop working. Part of application cannot send emails, cannot communicate, like our stuff stop working. So I'm not sure what exactly tried to achieve this boat, but this was results. So of course we start to digging out what to do. Our first approach was simple. Let's add the recapture. We add the, I think everybody knows this recapture version two, this checkbox. It's simple, it's very good to work, but sometimes recapture version two, like not very sure like you bought or not, and try to ask you additional questions. And of course, yeah, this question view can be like little tricky, as you can see, yeah. Yeah, like you're not sure. Is it car, <laughs> part of car or not? So, yeah, and of course, uh, some product owner said, I don't like this recapture because this can increase out of our user, they don't like this recapture stuff, so let's do something else. And Google released third version of recapture. So it's hidden, you don't see anything, but this recapture doesn't provide you true or false, bot or not bot. It provides score. It's score from zero to one. Zero is closer to bot, one is closer to human. So in these cases, if you integrate this stuff, it starts collecting information and for user action provides some score, like maybe 0.7 or 0.3. In these cases, you can decide which amount of this traffic you can reject and this, which amount of this traffic you can allow. So as you can see, it's collect some information, some uh, stuff. They say they use some machine learning. And as you can see, this is our score, for example, mostly 0.9 and some of score on 0.7 and maybe a small amount here. So in these cases, we're sure we can use not less than 0.7, and that's all, it's helpful for us. Also good about this recapture, you can provide different, uh, these scores for different flows. Like for registration, 0 0.4, but for billing, 0 0.7, for example. In these cases, you'll be sure, like this is more, like we can pass more, even bots in this approach, but not, for example, for billing. Let's go to Ruby and Rails now. So, First of all, which I will very quickly skip, I think everybody knows this, because sometimes everybody, why it doesn't work and start digging out what is this. It's cross-site request forgery. It's when uh, any website, additional website, cannot just do some post request or something like this without this additional generated hash, which generated only, only on your page. 
this is exactly against these attacks, which additional website can do some post requests. Next one is very interesting stuff, which already exists in Rails core, and you can use it in active support. It's called uh, security to secure compare. It's against timing attacks. So timing attacks, it's uh, side channel attacks, which used to compromise some, I don't know, security system like basic OWS uh, to, to measure time, how many times take to some request. So as I said, one of the biggest problem was, for example, basic OWS in Rails, and right now they use exactly this method, secure compare, and you can use this also method for your security comparison, like what exactly how, because this uh, one against this timing attack, because this is a very simple example. Uh, many systems use MemCPU to compare strings, like byte by byte, and as you closer to needed uh, secret stuff, then more time it take to compare these two strings. That's how it works these timing attacks. Yeah, also not very good news. Uh, it's about adding backdoors in our gems libraries and also NPMs. Uh, this is list of uh, not long time ago compromised libraries. Mostly it happens because credentials for publishing games was compromised. It's not about some Git uh, vulnerability or something else or Ruby gems, but it's still not very good news. Uh, right now, not, not exist many stuff which can help you. In most cases, we use games and box checking. So we have special virtual Linux machine with snapshots, with a bunch of uh, additional stuff on it. And we just use game unpack, then we clone. Of course, I have separate scripts for this. I don't do all this uh, by hand. I, it just clone the same source, check out the needed version, copy paste the same gem and check the div. If div too big, start digging out what is going on. This is how this system works. And of course, it's, if something start running in this machine, I just shut down this machine and go back to a previous snapshot. Uh, by the way, I use mostly gem unpack because if you will try to use gem install, somebody can add malicious uh, code which will run in post install script. That's why I not use gem install because I already can be compromised my machine. Uh, the same approach used for NPM, but for NPM a little harder because sometimes you also need additionally to pre-build NPM package to compare them. Uh, but oh, right now it's mostly current approach which we use for free. Of course, exist some services which can do this work for you for money. About tools, so for tools exist such stuff like Breakman, which mostly we integrate into CI, into Git hooks, which constantly running and checking that we don't have SQL injection stuff and anything else. Bundle audit and PM audit, GitHub security alerts, which say like these gems was compromised. Please new, use a new one. Secret data stores. Uh, if you need to store some secrets, please don't commit them into Git. Uh, you can use some HashiCorp vouts, some black box, maybe even you can use Git secrets, but in this case it will be encrypt this information, so information will exist in Git, but encrypted. Uh, for passwords, you can use some, I think everybody knows one, last pass, one pass, but who don't have money can use Buttercup. Uh, if you like GPG encryption, you can use pass go pass uh, dot GPG to encrypt all this password information. Uh, now let's go to SSH access. Of course, somebody will say like, I use Docker, so I'm safe. I don't need SSH. Of course, I imagine this picture. If somebody say I have Docker and I'm secure. Uh, yeah, because in most cases, you still need to go to access to some machine. You need, even if you have cluster with Docker stuff, sometimes you also need to go to, into this machine with Docker cluster to understand what is going on, why your Docker container not running as you expected. That's why you still need to use SSH. And SSH is a little hard because not understand how to rotate keys, how to use these keys, how to provide access to newcomers, uh, how to rotate access if somebody go away from the company or to another project. So we decided to use SSH certificate authentication. Idea is pretty simple. You have some identity provider, like with some private or public key. Uh, you sign this key, your public key by this provider and provider provide you certificates. It's very old feature. It's available, I think, 10 years ago in OpenSSH. And right now, uh, many companies start to using it. 
uh, because what good about this approach? There is no tofu. Uh, tofu mean like trust on first use. I think everybody remember then you first reconnect to some SSH server. It said this is public key. Do you? approved to connect to this server. And everybody, of course, I think, enter yes, so let's go, I need to this server. So Tofu provides you ability to create host-based uh, certificates, which you will spread on your dynamic cluster. In these cases, all the machine will uh, provide the same information, and you no need to enter this yes, yes for each new machine. Uh, also, in these cases, if you will see this message and using this host-based certification, you understand something going wrong, like this shouldn't be provided for me right now, this information. Also, it can be very simple integrated into SSO and multi-factor identification. It's easy to rekeke, and it also provides expiration for these certificates. You can provide information like how long this certificate works, maybe only for 10 minutes. Also, from which source IP addresses this certification can be used. For example, you use some bastion machine or only from your office network. In these cases, if somebody stole this certificate, it cannot be used because users should be also be in this environment. Uh, also, you can provide how exactly user can log in, what exactly force command need to be executed after user login into SSH. And this already used in Facebook, Uber, Netflix, all of them create even own solution on top of SSH certificates. Yeah, in our case, we even create our own solution because we know <laughs> because we want something our works as we expected. We was very impressed by Bless. Bless it's Netflix way. They have this serverless approach to generate these certificates because the main problem is always okay. I need this certificate authorized service. Who will do this? Okay, let's set up new machine. Okay. Who will access to this machine by SSH key? So like you have this problem like chicken or egg. Like I need create certificate authority, but who will access to this certificate authority? And in these cases, we start to use and adopt serverless because we can create serverless function and provide access to this serverless function by some uh, authentication approach from Amazon or Google. And that's why we use certain it, we wrote certain it, which provide exactly this approach. It support new this key with uh, elliptic curves. It support it also have the client stuff, which Bless doesn't have very good. They just have some Python script, and of course it support multiple projects because in our case, in our company, one person can work in several projects. It's uh, like for Netflix, they clearly build this approach because they have one big project, Netflix. And it works like one key for this project and so. But in our case, one person can sit on several projects. That's why certainly it supports like multiple projects, multiple keys, multiple providers. And of course, you can use the same, for example, Vault HashiCorp, you can set up and use something for these keys. Cashier, uh, SSH certificate pump models from Uber, it's additional model into OpenSSH. Uh, so, it's, I think, approach which everybody sh should suggest. Of course, yes, yeah, somebody will say, again, I don't have SSH, okay, uh, uh, it's okay. But still, many of us need this, and this is better approach to rotate keys and provide access, controlled access. So what about team? Yes. So yeah, of course, security team is also very important. So <laughs> I think many companies have this separate like security team, they only should do this, this is where work, they should provide all these security approaches, everybody else should just uh, write the code. Yes. But cultural, like good security cultural, I think everybody understands. So culture is like way you're thinking, working, behavior in some environment, in these cases in our companies. And even if you have these separate persons which like define or propose your security culture, Everybody in your company should build, improve, uh, support this organization, uh, this security culture, so it will be successful for you. So in these cases, uh, phrase like "we are equal partners" should be like reality, not some slogan. Uh, so yeah, for me and for everyone, I think you should firstly insist on, lock, on instill on concept that security belongs to everyone. So guys, yeah, if you're thinking you're only a developer, no. You're also like little, but still security specialist. Uh, concentrate on basics. Sometimes it's very simple, like, guys, let's create password policies. Let's activate two-factor authentication for everyone, like it's required. And it's already increased very quickly your security approaches. 
do you think that scale? Because as you said, as you saw, like we need some SSH security stuff, but we don't want to set up this. Okay, let's cry, create our own and automate this all stuff. Adopt some data security strategies, like zero trust architecture, for example. Like, because I saw some approaches like, okay, uh, we fully secure outside. Inside, we believe, uh, we trust every system, like everything, okay. And in these cases, if somebody penetrates into your office, connect some little Raspberry Pi device, and that's all, like starting going bad. Uh, be an enabler and gatekeeper, because I saw also security teams which like, stop everyone, let's block everything. It's just creating pain for yourself, for your team to deploy, to work. So it should be in this way. And of course, make security fun and engagement. Like, sometimes take some stuff like, let's do some pen test Friday. And so many developers like to do like little evil, play for little evil like hackers. So let's break our system and try how it works. And of course, my message to companies which thinks today haven't been attacked, you're not looking hard enough. So that's all, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei, for such great presentation. Any questions? Yeah, we have one and second. Let me try first. Okay. Go. Yes. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, it was really great. So maybe can you advise uh, some resources to go deeper? Because there is a lot of things to um, uncover. So Go deeper into security or uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So based on your presentation. Uh, of course, right now exist when many like these courses. I don't know, like Udemy courses or anything else, which already provide your like this courses for pen test person, like you can work from another side. It's sometimes even, even very useful information because you like see information from other side, how you will do something hacking or some other stuff. It's one of the uh, good way uh, like to increase your security understanding, how it works. And of course exists such, I don't know how it's called, certification stuff like you pass some certification, like web security certification, hardware security certification, IOT. So it depends where exactly you want to go and how to increase your knowledge. Because as you saw, like even this simple stuff can divide it by maybe you want to work in against intruder team. Like when something happens and everybody starts running in fire and you like exactly this now team which start, okay, Let's open our plan and start do something like, or maybe you want to do like certification stuff, like checking the system doesn't do everything by checklist because exist these uh, certifications like not open access by SSH, database not public, and in these cases you improve all this stuff for certifications. So it depends on you what exactly you in what rabbit hole you try to go. Yeah, thank you. Next one question. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I've got one question. Uh, for example, because uh, we work, for example, in the team they, uh, they're located in, uh, around the world. And for example, we use multiple tools and of course we build multiple tools that, that allow us to administrate our customers. So my question is, what do you say, for example, to use, for example, in admin panel, right, after, uh, under the VPN? Or it's another way to uh, prevent, uh, I mean, to allow our office, our um, guys from, from our, our staff, to use the admin panel. What's your solution for that? Uh, you mean like access to admin panel for, for yes. remote people? For, right. Yes, for remote, remote people, because we've got people from around the world. So, so. Oh, okay, so yeah, of course you can use these approaches like uh, separate VPN servers which you use, which uh, have whitelisted these IP addresses only to access to admin panels. Uh, for example, for many big organization, especially with financial, they, for example, for SSH access also use this approach with Bastion hosts. So it's like everything, all infrastructure in private network, but exist one host which uh, available in public and everybody need to connect to Bastion before go to another resources. So it's another approach. And yeah, of course, exists this authorization different mechanism which you can apply like, uh, uh, 
For example, right now exist LDAP systems, uh, these all protocols, which you can integrate into, each, uh, into different systems because it's like standard. And in these cases, restrict access on different level, like network level, HTTP level, so it depends on what type of also level you want to restrict access. So like right now, pretty huge amount of stuff. Uh, if you want like simpler and right away, as I said, VPN server, and only from the VPN server, team can work. We even have a very funny story because one, we work in a little company, not little, it's a big company, uh, financial, and they have all this restriction, like uh, they have even email stuff, calendars, uh, we should connect by VPN, and only in these cases we can work with these resources. And also they have this, of course they don't have remote teams, and we was first remote team, they give us VPN access, and also they have this politics, like you, uh, each three months your VPN access expired and your passwords. Uh, and what was funny, like all new VPN access and password was sent to email address which available only inside this network by VPN. So like, <laughs> like in one day you start to wake up, like VPN doesn't work and you cannot get new credentials because you need to connect by VPN to get these credentials. So in one day we start, we start like team with shared credentials because you're asking somebody, do you still have access? Yeah, this is my password email, please check my credentials and send me back. So, and maybe it's one of the reasons why they fired us in one day. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Alexei. Uh, next one. Uh, yeah, please. Hi. Uh, you've mentioned uh, HTTP security headers. Yes. And also you have mentioned uh, uh, auditing tools uh, for, for security, like Bundler Audit yes. and so on. Um, <clears throat> do you have an example of uh, such tool for HTTP security headers? Um, yeah, exist several even online tools, like for example, for SSH certificate, you can use some SSL test. Uh, also exist online tools, like you just give it URL and it will say like, this headers present, this not present, please add them. So I don't remember websites, but it's fully free. It's online, you don't need to install anything and it just will check your headers if it's present or not present. Uh, also, like many systems, like for example in Chef, exists such system like Inspec, uh, it's, uh, which for example can run in your server and check in like your server continuously. And your uh, server continuously have all these security checks, like OS have hardening, uh, OS doesn't have this open SSH with, op with passwords or allowed uh, login by roots. So yeah, exist separate tools. But about headers, it's very simple. You can use just online tools which just parse your headers and said you forgot about this one or this one. 